for the next speaker, we have Caroline Pomeroy, who's trying to get here. Um, she's the director of Climate Stewards, this banner here. She's been working for them for about two and a half years. Caroline has lived and worked in Ghana and Rwanda and has a master's in climate change impacts and sustainability, where her research was about the obstacles and catalysts to churches preaching and practicing care for creation. She also is a pilgrim to Paris and has cycled 300 miles here from her home uh, in England, <laughs> Somerset, to Paris. So with that uh, wonderful introduction, here we are, Miss Caroline. <laughs> The, is the clicker working? I don't know. It works okay, but you have to point it very specifically. Okay. So, good <laughs> afternoon. Um, yes, I've got my badge, my pilgrim's badge, so uh, I'm very proud of that. Um, I wanted to tell you a bit about climate stewards, uh, just as some example of how, how Christians can get involved in... Am I too close? Do I need to be closer to the speaker? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Swallow it. Swallow. Yeah. Bend down. Okay, how Christians can get involved in um, caring for creation. So, climate stewards was started by Arosha in 2007. It had two aims, to help churches and Christian organizations and individuals to understand more about carbon footprints and to try and reduce them, and to generate carbon funding for biodiversity conservation projects, which they were already undertaking in the developing world, bringing the triple benefits of carbon sequestration and mitigation, improving biodiversity and livelihoods. So Climate Stewards now works with many different churches, Christian NGOs, for example, Tear Fund and Compassion, and other organizations, businesses, who want to offset their unavoidable carbon emissions. They recognize they have a carbon footprint, they may have tried to cut it, but they can't get it down to zero. So that's what we can help them with. Oh, good. No, can I? Stand up mm. <laughs> and shout or not. Okay. Tell me if you can't hear me. Um, this, this is a kind of provocative title, but it's a common, it's a common um, uh, yeah. criticism of carbon offsetting. Mm -hmm. Is it a license to pollute? Yeah. George Monbiot, uh, famously described carbon offsets as papal indulgences, an excuse right. to uh, behave badly and keep on doing what you do. I want to just, just take a few minutes to explain what we do and perhaps to try and counter that, that argument. Um, it's not going to work. Oh, there we go. So two basic background premises that we have as an organization. We love God, so we want to care for his creation, and we love our neighbors, and we want to care for them. And that the atmosphere is a global commons. People often ask me, why don't you plant trees in England or Holland or wherever you are? Well, they grow faster in the tropics and they bring multiple benefits there as well. So that's where we work. And our key message is to reduce what you can and offset the rest. We're not encouraging people to just fly or continue their polluting lifestyles. We're trying to encourage people to think about their carbon footprint, to reduce it where they can and to offset the rest. So how does it work? Well, on our, our uh, website, you'll find the address on the bits of paper on your chairs, mm -hmm. we have a climate carbon calculator. And I've designed this especially for Catherine. Uh, <laughs> I used it, and it was very easy. It took me literally 15 seconds to offset my trip here. Thank you <laughs> for the plug. So you put your, your details in where you're going to and from, mm -hmm. uh, and it'll tell you how much money that will cost us to carry out the actions which will mitigate that amount of carbon dioxide. Um, our carbon calculator is based on the latest UK government data, emissions factors for each form of transport, multiplied by the distance between uh, airports in this case. Um, uh, and we add in uh, an uplift for the stacking and the, all, the, all the things that airplanes do before they get to the ground. And also an enormous amount, 90%, we, we, we multiply by 1.9 to reflect radiative forcing, which is the impact of emissions high up in the atmosphere. And as you can see, we have other tabs. We have Oh, this is the French version, so I was doing this last night. So we have the uh, ground travel, uh, we have our chez moi, so that's our, our household emissions, or your business, uh, your utility bills, and that all adds up to make our carbon footprint. We're currently working on a lifestyle tab. This is a more challenging. Uh, this is our consumption. This is how we eat, what we shop for, uh, what our hobbies, what we spend our spare time doing. It's much more difficult to quantify but we're working on it and hope to have it ready by January. So, having calculated the amount of our, uh, of our carbon footprint, that's number two there, 
We then transfer that money to projects we support in the developing world, which bring multiple benefits, biodiversity, um, some income for local people, livelihoods, and health benefits also in the case of things like cook stoves. And then we, we can guarantee to people that we have offset that amount of carbon. Our work started in Ghana, our primary project is in Ghana, where we work with schools and communities uh, in two areas of, of Ghana. One is around Kumasi, which is in the middle of Ghana. My favorite thing about this is their school uniforms. I think they're fantastic. Um, so we work with, with schools. They have uh, plantations of trees on school sites, indigenous trees, which they're using as kind of outdoor classrooms. They're working on the land. Uh, they're, plant, they're learning how to plant trees, how to care for them, how to weed them, um, how to measure them. And they're taking those benefits home as well. So they're, they're, they're often encouraged to, to do things at home. We also work in a much more challenging uh, area of Ghana in the north, around Damongo, which is around a national park called Mole. Uh, much poorer Muslim communities, Sahelian environment, so quite tough, difficult to grow trees in. And it has been challenging, but it, we've learned a lot of lessons mm -hmm. and we have grown some trees, which is fantastic. Um, these are the, uh, the two on the top on the right are both up in the north. Um, and trees grow very fast there. Uh, we, this man on the right is one of our community coordinators. So he's someone who's paid by climate stewards to manage a group of farmers, to care for their trees, to answer their questions, to support them along the way. Uh, he's called Mr. Joe. And the tree behind him is six years old. So they do grow fast. The man on the left, Mr. Saki, is the headmaster of a school. And this was one of his trees which he planted. La they planted last year. He described the trees as his third daughter. He loves the trees very much. As well as the indigenous trees that we plant, 10% of the sites are allocated for fruiting trees to give the uh, people a crop, some kind of income in the short and medium term. So depending on what the conditions are, they'll choose different things, oil palms, mangoes, citrus fruits, or cashew. And another part of what we do is education. It's very important that the school children understand what's going on. So we, do, we have school environment clubs which are funded through Climate Stewards work where the kids learn much more about environmental education and practical conservation work, as well as what the Bible is saying, so about Christian stewardship too. And schools benefit from incentive schemes. This is something to, to encourage them to, to keep going. Uh, they all choose what suits them best. So we've got one top left is Mr. Saki with his rabbits, which breed like rabbits. And on the right, uh, some beehives in another school. A fish pond, bottom left, where they, they've stocked it with fish, which obviously help in terms of bringing uh, good nutritional food to the school kids, and they can sell them as well. And on the right, uh, that's a grass cutter, which is a kind of a local, like a cane rat, a uh, bush rat. So it's a very valuable resource, actually. They sell them for a lot of money. Um, so that's a great form of income. They eat them? They eat them. They do. Yeah. They <laughs> Sorry? They eat it. Yeah, it's, it's bush meat. Yeah. Uh, and then we measure how big the trees have grown. So we, the kids learn how, how to measure trees, uh, the one on the right is a Kapok tree. That's one of our um, site coordinators. In fact, is Daryl here? No. no. <laughs> That's Daryl's colleague. Okay. So this is a man called Prosper uh, who looks after that whole region. This tree is six years old and it's 25 meters tall. They grow really, really fast. Um, the one in the middle, there's a schoolboy in the middle in his green shirt. That, those trees were planted four years earlier. So it's very impressive, the rate of growth that we achieve. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're stake, taking seedlings. In the north, this lady had one acre of land, and she, tends, she has tended that for the last six years. And this is what she, you can see behind her, the trees that she's grown. She's incredibly proud of them. And she'll talk really passionately about how the local climate has changed. It's cooler. It's shadier. She can hear the birds and the bees and the butterflies. And she just really enjoys being there. So, as well as Ghana, we support two other projects. One's in Kenya, where we support a project which does improve cook stoves, water filters, and solar lamps. And another in Mexico, which is doing agroforestry work, very similar to the Ghana project, working with smallholders, uh, encouraging them to plant trees on their land. And in the UK, and also in the Netherlands, we do education and advo advocacy work. So we're involved in campaigning, for climate justice, we go to Christian festivals, 
we go to secular marches and demonstrations. We're here at COP. Uh, we go into schools. We work with churches. We produce resources for churches. And we're basically about trying to explain how that gas in the balloons, how the carbon dioxide, which we get kids to blow up balloons uh, and imagine how much carbon dioxide might be in them, how that is converted into a tree like this, which is only, again, six years old. Wow. Uh, and the answer, if you're curious, is that uh, if we blew up 28,000 balloons between us and they were full of CO2, which of course they wouldn't be, they would fill up the same volume as four and a half London buses. That's what a ton of CO2 looks like. And it's quite helpful, I think, to visualize how it, how it fits together. So in conclusion, is offsetting a license to pollute? Well, I would argue it's not. <laughs> it, it provides a helpful mechanism to educate people concerning the role of CO2 in climate change by making that link, that connection, between our carbon footprints and how much it costs to offset them. It also, I think this is really important, it enables people to do something about it. Often we feel powerless. It gives you... It shifts people from being part of the problem to part of the solution. It's not the solution on its own, but it's part of it. <laughs> and so I'd say it's not a license to pollute, but it is a responsible way to deal with unavoidable carbon emissions. Thank you.